But again, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, looking at verses 8 through 14. Now, God's economy, uh, or, or the kingdom economics, uh, as you think about those things, and I've talked about them in different times, God's economy is different than our economy. We do things differently than, than God does, right? And, and that almost goes without saying, but, but it's honestly more significant than most of us think. Uh, if you can think back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, for instance, uh, it, it, he operates and God operates in, in a different way, and it becomes very clear to us that the things that we value, that the, the way that we think things should be done, are not the way that God tends to do them, right? And, and if you've studied those Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, you'll hear where Jesus says things like, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when people persecute you, right? But that's not our economy as humans, right? That's not the way we wish things are. We're like, no, 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 no. Blessed are the rich. Or, or, or blessed are you when nobody's saying bad things about you, right? Or, or, or in this digital age, blessed are you when you get likes on Facebook or, 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 or Instagram, right? Or, or blessed when you have a following on TikTok. That's, that's blessed, right? And, and in the world that we, we live in, where things aren't always the way we want them to be, um, God's economy is different than ours. And if you read through your Bible and, and you watch how God gets things done throughout the history in the Bible, you'll see that, that, that God works differently. Because you see, God often works in the small things, not the big things. And, and, and it's often the, the small stuff, not, not the big powerful things. It's the, the, the weak over the powerful in the Bible, right? It's the, the slow over the speedy. It's the, it's the tortoise beating the hare, so to speak. And God's economy is different than our economy. And that's going to show up very specifically in our passage today, which is why I wanted to start there. So with that, uh, feel free to join me in Luke chapter 2, verses 18 through 14, and I'm going to read those here for you. And there it reads, And in the same region, which is this region around Bethlehem, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now let's talk about that. Here you have uh, an explosion, right, in, in the darkness of the sky. This is back before street lights. This is back before, you know, all the light pollution uh, we, we live far enough away from the Twin Cities, we don't get a lot of that light pollution, right? But if you live in, like, the cities for a period of time, you almost reach a point where you forget how beautiful stars can be. Because you just can't see much of them. There's so much light pollution. Now, you get up north here, or, or I used to work in New Mexico, in the mountains of New Mexico, where you're, like, forever away from anything with any sort of light. You can see just amazing, amazing stars. And in the story here, we have this explosion in the darkness of the sky, this light outside the city of Bethlehem. And because you and I live here in 2019, and often many of us have probably been in the church for the majority of our whole lives, we've been led to believe that, that, that because the prophet said this was going to happen, that there was this great expectation that, that this was going to happen right around this time, right? But that's not true. There, there was nothing in the Bible and, and, and nothing in the intertestamental period to give us that idea. And if you don't know what the intertestamental period was, uh, that's that, you know, as, as you flip through your Bibles, the intertestamental period is that one page between Malachi and Matthew, right? That blank page. If, if you haven't studied uh, the Bible, that's, that's the time where the Maccabean books come from, which are not canonical Bibles, but that, that's, that's that kind of 400-year 
long window of relative silence. And it's not that, that God wasn't working and that God wasn't active during those 400 years. There was just no official prophet of God saying, thus says the Lord. So none of it got recorded and, and written down and put into Scripture. But we know during this period God was still speaking because we know when, when Mary uh, goes to the temple to dedicate Jesus, you've got some people there that, uh, that, that have been given words by the Holy Spirit that they wouldn't die until they saw Jesus. And so we know God is speaking in that season. We just don't have the official office and the official voice of one of his prophets. There's, there's effectively 400 years of silence. And because of that, nobody was sitting around on this night, on the hills outside of Bethlehem. Nobody was sitting there going, oh yeah, the Messiah, he's probably coming tonight, right? Uh, they, they, they weren't. They, that wasn't the way it was working. They weren't sitting there going, any minute now I think Jesus' signs are going to start appearing, so we'll expect the baby to be born, right? That's not what happened. I, I, when, I, when I think of this story, in fact, how many of you have seen The Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, right? Most of us? When I think of this story, it, it's more like Linus waiting for The Great Pumpkin. There wasn't a big crowd of people with Linus waiting for this to happen. There wasn't a, a bunch of expectation. Oh yeah, here comes the great pumpkin, right? No, it, nobody was expecting that to happen. Nobody was, nobody, I mean, they knew eventually it was going to happen, but nobody expected on that night and that time and that place that this was going to go down. And so we have God showing up in an unexpected time. God does that, doesn't he? He shows up in unexpected times. Let me share with you a, a little bit of my own personal testimony. And some of you, many of you, probably heard a little bit of it before. And if you've heard it before, I'm sorry. I only have one, and that's all I have, so I can't share more than that. But, but if you don't know my story, I didn't come to faith in Jesus until I was in college my freshman year. And if you were looking at my life from the outside, you would have thought that everything was pretty awesome for me, right? Right? I was a starter for the football team. I was the only freshman starter on my college football team. I had a big athletic scholarship. In fact, I had the biggest athletic scholarship in the whole team. I also had an honors academic scholarship beyond that. I was dating the head football cheerleader. And, and I was invited to all the parties, and I was at all the good parties, right? Uh, I, I was well-known. I was well-liked. Life was good, right? Except it wasn't. I was miserable, in fact. And I fully believe in that part in time of my life, even before I knew him, that, that God was building in me a discontent to get my attention. Because, you see, in that time, my life was all about me. I, I, was, I was incredibly selfish, and I cared very little for what others thought about that. My friendships were shallow. I was probably not a very good friend. My dating life was a, a sin-filled mess. And I wasn't even happy about the way I was playing football, in fact. And I just kept trying harder. I kept trying to do more. I'd, I'd look at other people, right? And I'd judge them knowing I was better than them and I was living better than them. But I was miserable. And everything I was doing was trying to make myself happy. Yet all of that just served to make me more and more miserable, frankly. And for me, it was in my dorm room, January, in a lofted bed, you know, so I'm like seven feet off the floor, laying there at 2 a.m. God has just put the heat on me, the pressure on me. Finally, it was there that I realized I had just made a mess of my life and I just, I was done with it. And I said, God, it's yours. Take it. I turned my life over to Christ right there. And in, and in that, the, the Spirit of God showed up at this incredibly unexpected time and changed the course of my life. And He still does that to this day, right? Sometimes we get to experience that that, that spiritual breakthrough like that, right? That, that moment of, of amazingness. And it's awesome when that happens. God shows up at unexpected times. 
But more often than not, it comes at a, a different unexpected time when God works and moves in our lives. Because you see, there's this other unexpected time that God changes our lives through. But this one's quite the opposite of the one I was just talking about. It's that, that long, slow process of transformation that in any given moment is kind of difficult for us to see. Because here's the thing, growing spiritually is often a slow process that takes lots of work. And from, from day to day, it can be hard to see any changes or improvements in our spiritual walk. But when you look back at 10 or, or, or maybe 20 years, you can see how far you've come. You can see and find how, how God has been doing great things in you and through you, even when you didn't notice it, right? It was just like this morning. I, I was out in the lobby just after warming up for praise team. And, and young little Brooklyn, uh, one of the granddaughters of our church member, I haven't seen her for quite some time. And she's now three, right? Yeah, so Brooklyn's three. And I, I think it's been at least six months since I've seen Brooklyn. And you forget how much kids grow at that age in that period of time, right? When you see, like my son, I see him every day. I, I never notice my son growing except for all of a sudden his pants are too short. Right? You don't notice that gradual change, but all of a sudden you're like, oh, we've got to get you a new wardrobe. Or, or Brooklyn, you've gotten so big. And the same thing, God shows up in unexpected times in our lives because we don't necessarily always notice or see it but he's still showing up in our lives, working on us. And that's why we, we keep running the race. That's why we keep pressing on. That's why we keep studying. That's why we keep praying. That's why we keep hanging out with other like-minded Christians, because God is in work inside of those things. And we never know when God is going to show up. That's what makes this really cool. You just never know when God is going to show up. God shows up at unexpected times, sometimes in a snap, like when I came to faith, and other times over that long haul of faith. But it's not just at unexpected times that God shows up. He also shows up in some unexpected places too, right? Now you and I, because we live in 2019, we're like, Bethlehem, of course, right? Oh, little town of Bethlehem. We sing that, right? And I get it that we, we have this misconception because in our world, the whole world is looking at little town of Bethlehem going, yeah, that's it, that's the spot. But the truth is, there is nothing in the Bible that, that, that led people to know that this was the time and this was the place that all of this was going to be going down. Many of you know this, but it's good to review it each year. Bethlehem was, was, a, was a nowhere was, a, was a, a backwater town, right? An unimportant town of its time. It was a, a, a blink and you'll miss it kind of place. If you were zooming by at 70 on your camel, it was gone. It was a town that was once something. It had a history, right? But now, nothing significant. If you read your Old Testament, you know that it was part of the story of David and that there was this Boaz connection with it in the book of Ruth. But in Jesus' time, this was like, it was like the town of Ironton, right? It, there was something there once, but now it's, there's not a lot going on. There was once something going there, but time had kind of passed it by. And then God shows up in this unexpected place. It's Bethlehem. Nobody knew it was going to be in Bethlehem until much, much later, in fact. So we have this breakthrough happening, this kingdom of God breaking through, this light shining in the darkness, the, the devil being destroyed, salvation entering the world at an unexpected time and an incredibly unexpected place. And that's how God breaks through into our lives. Breakthroughs most often happen and show up in unexpected places. Another unexpected place where God breaks into those dark corners of our lives is here. We think we 
have these places of our lives that we've hidden, right? Dark corners. Things we don't want to talk about. Stuff maybe we've been running from for year after year after year. We think we can hide from it. Or we think we can hide it at least from others at the very least. But God knows. And He knows that you need a, a, a breakthrough in that, that deep, dark place. Those places where you feel lost in sin. God can work in those places if you'll let Him in. Those, those relationships that feel out of control, God can show up in those and change them. Those things that, that keep you up at night worrying because you have no control over it, God is greater than those things and knows all about it and wants you to turn to Him in it. God works in unexpected places because He's greater than we often give Him credit for. And don't fall into the trap of thinking that you have to do it yourself or that God can't help you in it. That's the very place where we need to ask the Spirit of God to come and move into us and to break us and to, to work in us and to do what we cannot do with our best efforts. Have you ever struggled with something? Struggled with a, 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 a sin? Something you haven't been able to beat out of yourself, maybe through discipline, right? That's why Jesus came into this world. It was exactly for this. Jesus came into the world to work in those unexpected places of your life. The Spirit of God and, and the glory of Christ and the, the power of the kingdom shows up in unexpected places at unexpected times. But it also shows up in unexpected people as well. The shepherds, right? Goodness, if, if you're doing this, right? Here's kingdom economics, right? If you're, if you're like, oh man, firstborn son of God, little baby Jesus coming into the world, let's throw him a party. Who should we invite? Let's invite some shepherds. Hold on a second. Aren't they thieves? Yeah. Aren't shepherds kind of filthy? Oh yeah, they're rank. Aren't they drunkards? Ah, most of them. These are guys who lived out on the frontier, right? A, a, a group of men that that... You know, you guys hanging around the campfire every night, spending long stretches of time without other people. My guess is that wasn't a haven for righteousness. If you've ever sat around a campfire with a bunch of guys, you know what I'm talking about. They weren't sitting there reading the Torah together, is my guess. The shepherds, they were outcasts. Their lives made them ritually unclean. Made them so they weren't allowed to go to worship because they weren't pure. They were considered thieves by society. They were outcasts. Normal people wanted nothing to do with them. And they would tend to stay out of town for long periods of time because of this. They knew. They knew that they were outcasts. And in God's economy, who needs to hear first that there's good news of great joy for all people. Well, if it's truly for all people, then you need to get started with the shepherds because they're the ones who think that they are outside of it. The good news of great joy is for all people, not just the put-together ones, right? Not just the strong ones, not just the ones who have it all figured out in life. How many of you have been getting some Christmas cards? Yeah? I put some in your boxes, right? Most of you have probably seen them. There's some hanging on the wall out there. There's some for you to sign if you haven't signed them this morning because they're going to disappear. But we get these Christmas cards. and We made one this year, right? And in and, and every Christmas card, every one, I've never seen one that wasn't this way. Everyone looks pretty happy, right? He looks pretty good. You got your clothes on. You're looking right. But that doesn't 
necessarily give us a true representation of what might be going on in our lives. Because, you know, right before that picture was taken, that dog was spazzing out and rolling in something that smelled really bad. <laughs> right? That, the, you picked him up on, but smiled, because the dog smelled bad. Or, or, you never include in that Christmas card that, that grumpy shot where dad and the kids are being forced to wear matching outfits. <laughs> right? You, you don't picture that shock and surprise and frustration face. And you don't, you don't include on your Christmas card that photo of mom where she's about to lose her Christmas spirit because somebody just recorded on the DVR over all of her, all of her, every single one of her Hallmark Christmas stories. They recorded Duck Dynasty reruns. She's about to lose her Christmas spirit, right? You don't put that on your Christmas card. No, you put us at your best. But here's what that does. And I'm not saying take a Christmas card with your worst. That's not what I'm saying. That would be crazy. But I am saying that, that this Christmas card idea, this, this idea of this culture, it, it, it puts pressure on us. Not on, the, not on the giver, but actually on the receiver, right? Because when you get that, you go, Oh, look how pretty. Look how well decorated. Look how, look how perfect their children are. What's wrong with mine? Look how happy everyone is. Why aren't we happy like them? The good news of, of great joy for all peoples is for the weak, for the broken, for the, the frail and the exhausted. And that is the place where breakthrough happens. I'd love for us to all get to the place where eventually we understand that the people of God, we're kind of messy. You look at us and you go, gosh, they are, they're, they're a mess, right? They don't have it all together. But they're being sanctified over this long period of time. And what that means, though, is sanctification. Justification is that, that moment of coming to faith. Sanctification is that Long, slow, gradual, hopefully becoming more and more like Jesus every day. But in the middle of that, becoming more and more like Jesus, we're still a mess, right? We're messier than we want to be. Maybe I'm the only one. But I think we're messier than we want to be. I'd like to be farther along than I am. But we need to learn to be secure that, that God is working in that process, that He is growing me into the fullness of Jesus Christ, that I may not have arrived, but I'm on my way there. It's just moving a little more slowly than I would like for it to move. Joy is found in the fact that breakthrough happens among an unexpected community of people. It happens among us. And if this is true, then how does that work? And what does that mean for you and for me? Uh, let me say something that you probably you don't hear elsewhere. Right? It's not a bad thing. But my guess is most of us can accept grace from Jesus. And most of us are pretty good, and, and in fact, most of us are almost demanding and, and, and in a way almost entitled that we should receive grace from others. But most of us really struggle being gracious to ourselves. Don't we? We're good at taking Jesus' grace. We demand grace from others, but we're not very good at being gracious towards ourselves. But we should be more. We should be farther along. We shouldn't, we, we, we feel like, oh, I shouldn't struggle with that anymore, right? I shouldn't be weak like that anymore, right? Says who? Who said you shouldn't have weaknesses and flaws and failures? We all do. And those questions only lead to self-condemnation. Satan would love to fight you in darkness. 
And in the dark, he's going to kick your rear. But if you drag his lame self out into the light, you can beat it. We already covered this back in the book of John, right? The light has shone in the darkness. In the darkness, it will not overcome. So what does that mean for us? What if the thoughts in our head that, well, I should be better than that. I should be further along than that. I should be more than that. What if we took those thoughts and we replaced them with what's true in the Word of God? About what Jesus has been for us. Because you see, our righteousness comes from Him and not from ourselves. So we need to work on that. Be gracious to yourself. Let God work in unexpected ways and unexpected places in unexpected people just like you. And then one step further, what does this mean for the people that you love? For the people in your life who maybe seem almost beyond the saving work of Christ. If there's one thing the Bible and Christian history teaches us, it's that God's economy looks for that place where, where you're not expecting. And that's where He pours Himself out. In Jesus' time, that was in the shepherds, right? And who is that for us today? Who are you going to encounter in the next couple of weeks? Maybe somebody in your family. Maybe at one of your holiday gatherings. Maybe it's somebody at one of your Christmas parties. Who is it you're going to encounter that you almost think, is, that guy's almost too far for Jesus to reach, right? Who are you going to see? Who are you going to meet? Who are you going to encounter that's far, far from God? Pray for them. Don't judge them. Be gracious and pray for them. Pray that God would move in them. Pray for yourself too. That God might use you. Or at least that God might soften your heart towards them. The one who showed himself first to the shepherds at an unexpected time, at an unexpected place, among an unexpected people, still does that work today. And as you leave today, I pray that you would be moved by, by God, how, how He works through this story of our lives. That He is at work in us. And He is at work in the world around us. Even in places we don't see it. Even in times where we don't know it. Even in people where we might doubt it. God is at work in it. And He wants to work in us and through us. And he can do amazing things. Just like he did then. He's still working today. The same power that was in this story is in our lives as Christ followers today. God is at work. Go, go forth and be part of that work with him. And be a blessing to the world around you. Amen? To God be the glory. Let's pray.